perhaps you are familiar with the Confucius saying, if you give a man a fish, he will eat for a day. But if you teach him to fish, he will eat for a lifetime. Or will he? Can he equally afford the lessons, supplies, and equipment necessary to fish? Does he have access to a pond that is not polluted? And if he does, does that pond have enough fish to feed him and his family on a daily basis, more or less a lifetime? Does the fisherman have any disabilities that would prevent him from being able to fish? Does he live in a warm climate where the pond will not freeze over? And if he does not, does he have access to the tools, supplies, and equipment necessary to fish? I think you get the gist of where I'm going with this. This cookie cutter belief that if you provide a member or members of a marginalized population with a resource, tool, or supply, or piece of information, such as education, they should automatically pull themselves up by their bootstraps and thrive. This belief has been fundamental to US public policy for the past 100 years. The problem with this belief is it does not take into account the vicious spider web of systemic racism and social disadvantages. Now I'd like to pause here to talk a bit further about systemic racism and provide a bit of clarification based on the gospel according to Latrice. It is my belief and conclusion that when we talk about systemic racism, there's a misconception that we're saying a specific group of individuals working in a particular field are naturally racist. However, what we're saying is that it's the totality of ways in which US society fosters the narrow-minded institutional policies, procedures, guidelines, and practices that are actually producing the interpersonal conflict. In a metaphor embodied by the, the Racial Equity Institute's report, the groundwater approach, the claim is that systemic racism is embedded in the groundwater, that groundwater, the water beneath the surface and the cracks, the soil, the foundation, kind of like the portion of the iceberg that we don't see and or address. That is the area that causes the most damage. At the end of this talk, it is my goal that everyone understands that racial inequities look the same across systems and socioeconomic differences do not always explain those racial inequities. Because inequities are caused by systems, regardless of a person's behavior or their culture. Since we all have nearly the same physiological makeup, heart, circulatory system, and other organs, factors other than our genes and bad luck are contributing to health disparities. The premise of the zip code effect is at work here. Health disparities not only impact the daily experiences of individuals, they threaten the prosperity and well-being of entire communities. You see, health outcomes are directly connected to where you live, work, play, age, and worship. And the lack of equitable access to care, systemic racism, bias, both implicit and explicit, as well as a lack of culturally competent care, play a role in health disparities. The zip code effect. Simple truth. Researchers have proven that the neighborhood in which you live may reduce your life expectancy by up to 30 years. Therefore, it is your zip code and not your genes that are the greatest predictor of your life expectancy. Zip, code, effect. I mean, think about it. Certain neighborhoods have fewer full service grocery stores than liquor stores. A Dollar General with fatty processed foods on every corner, limited to no access to fresh fruits and vegetables. There is no outdoor green space for physical activity and bike lanes are non-existent. Zip code effect. Now, a moment ago, I mentioned bias. So let's talk about implicit bias. Implicit bias will rear its ugly head regardless of your intent. It is involuntarily triggered. It will unintentionally show up throughout your daily interactions. And the interactions of physicians and frontline healthcare workers is no exception. 
your implicit bias, those unconscious beliefs and stereotypes that we all hold about specific groups of people that influence our attitudes and our behavior. This is a greater predictor of how you may behave than is your conscious values. So imagine with me how this plays out. Several years ago, one evening after getting ready for bed, which means I was in my bonnet, my oversized t-shirt, my pajama pants, admittedly not looking my best. I'm washing dishes and gash my hand with the glass. The blood is pouring from the wound. I only have time to grab a towel and wrap it around my hand, slide into my slippers and head out the door. Admittedly, again, not looking my best. Upon arrival at the hospital, the physician orders x-rays and as the transporter is wheeling me down the hall, we engage in small talk. She somehow uncovers that I actually work for this particular organization. And she says to me, do you clean? Do I clean? African-American female, healthcare executive, doctorate degree. And her question to me was, do I clean? Bad day? or implicit bias. Fast forward to the interaction with the physician. He comes back in the room and he says, everything looks great. I'm gonna have my assistant come in, stitch you up. You come back and see us in five to seven days to have your sutures removed. I exclaimed to him, I cannot move my pinky finger. He says, mm, everything looks good. I'll see you back in about a week. Why? Did he not, is this implicit bias or a bad day, right? Why did he not consult with the orthopedic hand surgeon that was on call that evening? I don't know, I may never know. But let's unpack this interaction. The transporter, she assumed I worked for housekeeping, as many people of color within this particular organization did. Now the physician, he assumed I was on Medicaid. He dismissed my concerns without a second thought. And he instructed me to come back to the hospital to have my stitches removed, not to my primary care physician, which would have been the appropriate follow-up action. Due to his actions, or lack thereof, I fell victim to a despair health outcome. Because of the delay in treatment, the tendons in my pinky finger had retracted to my elbow causing me to have to undergo an extensive reconstructive surgery and months of physical therapy. Had he consulted with the surgeon and I had surgery that evening or within the next couple of days, I would not have experienced such a despair health outcome. Again, the gospel, according to Latrice. Bias, regardless of intent, causes harm. If you could see what I could see, you would see that we need to level the playing field in order to eradicate health disparities. The two approaches most commonly used by social justice advocates are equity and equality. And although these terms are oftentimes used interchangeably, they are two totally different concepts. From where I sit, from a health, a health information standpoint, E equality means that we treat everyone the same, while in contrast, equity means that we treat individuals based on what they need to thrive. Public health advocates look at equity from a downstream, upstream approach. Downstream, meaning saving those that are already in the water. So treating people who may have hypertension, diabetes, and helping them manage that disease state. And then upstream, we want to prevent people from falling in the water. Now, this is a heavier lift because it requires legislation and policy. So as an example, ensuring that everyone has high quality health insurance and equitable access to health care. Salud.com has a phenomenal parable on their website that I'd like to share with you to help drive home this approach. One afternoon, there was a man and a lady and they were fishing and 
they notice a lady struggling in the river. So of course they jump in and they save her. And then there's a man, so they jump in and they save him too. Now this goes on all afternoon until finally they decide to walk upstream, walk up the riverbank and see what is going on. And they notice this beautiful outlook with this narrow bridge that people are standing on so that they can look out and experience this great view. So of course they go back in the city and they notify the city officials and the officials come in and they place warning signs and they put a little barrier around the bridge because preventing the problem saves energy, resources, and lives. So what do we do? I am so glad you asked. We started today with the Confucius saying, if you give a man a fish, he will eat for a day, but if you teach him to fish, he will eat for a lifetime. But only if we address any disabilities that fishermen may have. We ensure that he has equitable access to the tools, resources, and supplies necessary to fish. And most importantly, we have to make sure that pond is not polluted. So here are three takeaways from three distinct perspectives to help us channel our efforts more effectively as health justice advocates. The consumer, which is all of you. Become an informed consumer so that you can make good decisions. Familiarize yourself with the services and resources that are available to help you attain the healthiest version of yourself as possible. Next, allies. Again, guess what? That's you. Join community, social, and civic groups that are focused on reducing race-based health disparities and then listen to understand and not just respond to the people of color that are within those or in that organization. And then go back into your circles of influence and challenge racist beliefs and biases that you encounter. And lastly, community partners. Guess who that is? It's you. Collaboration is essential. We must all work together to ensure every member of our community has equitable access to what they need to thrive. I'd like to share these words with you from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that were spoken over 60 years ago, but that still hold true today. Of all forms of inequality, Injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. So let's all do our part to move the delivery of resources, services, care, and information from transactional to transformational. Thank you.